folks. Welcome for joining us. We're going to start up in just a handful of minutes. Here are our, here our early entries. So bear with us while we let some of the other folks into the room. And like I said, we'll get going in, in just a few minutes. Really appreciate everybody joining us on a, on a Wednesday evening. We're probably gonna give it a couple of minutes past six so that folks who started a little bit late have some time to jump in. Once again, thanks for joining us. We're just going to give it another minute or two for, for folks to attend if they're coming in a little bit late, and then we will jump right into our presentation. So give us another minute or so, and we'll start. And we've got a good number of folks coming in today. I think we'll give it another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get into it. Starting to see the new folks coming in level off a little bit. So I think we're almost there. Give it a few more seconds and then we'll get started. All right. I think we're good. I think uh, we'll probably have a few more folks join us, but I think it's probably time for us to get started. Thank you all for joining us today on your Wednesday afternoon to learn about the Chehalis space and strategy. Before we get into it, I'm going to hand it off to Casey, who is going to talk a little bit about the technology we're using today. Thank you, Nat. All right. Hello, everybody. Just a couple of friendly reminders about Zoom before we get going. This webinar is being recorded and all attendees will be muted. The chat function is disabled. And if you have any technical difficulties, please reach out to me at cheart at rossstrategic.com. At the bottom of your screen, you can enable live transcripts. You can also listen to the Spanish interpretation with the interpretation setting. And we will have question and answer. The box is open at all times for you to put um, your questions in. And you can upvote other people's questions as well and submit these anonymously. And there will be designated times when these questions will be answered. The raise hand feature is disabled. And at the end, if you are joining via phone, you can hit star nine and we can call your name verbally. verbally. Back to you, Nat. Thanks, Casey. So we've got two speakers tonight. I am one of them. I'm Nat Kale. I'm the principal planner and the acting director of the Office of Chehalis Basin. And I am Cindy Malay. I'm the program operations coordinator for OCB, and I provide strategic planning and performance reporting support for the program. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks. I'm going to go through our agenda really quickly, and then we'll have our first poll. So the big question that we're going to try and answer today is what is the Chehalis Basin strategy? Um, then we're going to get into the Chehalis Basin board and the phased approach that they're taking to develop a Chehalis Basin strategy. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the on the ground work that we plan to do in the next couple of years. So from the middle of 2023 to the middle of 2025. And we're going to wrap up by giving you a few resources that you can use to learn some more about the Chehalis Basin strategy and the Office of Chehalis Basin 
and the Chaos Basin Board. And then we'll have some time at the end for a Q&A session. And you can use the Q&A function that Casey told you about earlier for that. So uh, Casey is going to open up for a poll now. Hopefully that's easy to read, but in case it's challenging, on a scale of one to five, how well do you know what the Chehalis Basin strategy is? Go ahead and put your answer in, and we'll give it maybe 30 seconds, and then we will show you the results of the poll. And some answers coming in. All right. A little over half of folks now. Okay. Most people, we'll give it another five or 10 seconds. Go ahead and click on one of those responses if you haven't yet. All right, I think we've got our answer. You wanna go ahead and display the poll? All right, thanks, Casey. So we're seeing a pretty diverse group tonight. I think we've got some folks who are very aware of what we do here at the Chalice Basin Strategy. We've got a big chunk of folks kind of in the middle. They know some stuff. Hopefully we'll be able to teach you some more stuff tonight. And then I see we do have a few folks for whom this is gonna be really new. Uh, so hopefully you'll learn a lot of good information and uh, also who to reach out to if you wanna learn more. Thanks, Casey. Let's go ahead and stop sharing those results. And let's jump into the presentation for today. Is the Chalice Basin strategy. So, uh, in 2007, in 2005, uh, and 2009, there was massive flooding throughout the Chehalis Basin. 2007 was particularly big. This basin has flooded for as long as people have lived here, and historically, flood damage reduction has been seen as being in opposition to recovering aquatic species like salmon. So in response to that flooding in 2007 and 2009, then Washington State Governor Christine Gregoire established a working group and she charged that group with two goals, reduce flood damages and improve aquatic species. And that working group was the origin of the Chehalis Basin strategy. Uh, there were other groups around at the time, and we do particularly want to call out the fact that the Chehalis River Basin Flood Authority did play a foundational role um, by coordinating early direct response efforts to address flood damage in the basin, as well as by being one of the primary entities in that initial work group that grew to be the Chehalis Basin strategy. So after the work group was founded several years afterwards in 2016, the Washington State, Washington State Legislature officially created the Office of Chehalis Basin and the Chehalis Basin Board as part of the State Department of Ecology. Slide please. The Chehalis Basin Strategy is a network of partners and projects dedicated to protecting communities from flood damage, restoring critical habitat for aquatic life, and ensuring the Chehalis Basin is safe and prosperous for people, fish, and wildlife. It is administered by the Office of Chehalis Basin within the Washington Department of Ecology, and it is guided and overseen by the Chehalis Basin Board, which is a group of representatives with diverse interests and perspectives from across the basin. The Chehalis Basin Board consists of seven voting members representing the Quinault Indian Nation, the Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation, and the Basin's local flood authority, as well as agricultural, environmental, and other community interests. There are also five ex officio, or non-voting, members representing state agencies. It depends on many partners and collaborators across the Chehalis Basin and the state to inform the path forward and to take projects from ideas to reality. The strategy is simply not possible without the support of our partners. We have an incredible network of partners, including local landowners across the basin, 
I also want to explicitly mention the Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation and the Quinault Indian Nation. The Chehalis Basin's rich history and present are shaped by the ancestral heritage of numerous tribes. And today the land continues to be stewarded by those two sovereign nations who are integral parts of the Chehalis Basin Board, as well as across strategy projects and programs. Next slide, please. This is generally what we do, and we'll give you more detail later in the presentation, but they really fall into these three major things. We help residents and communities protect their homes and businesses from flood damage. We work with landowners to slow harmful erosion and restore habitats for salmon and for other aquatic life. And we prepare the region and uh, its future generations for more frequent major and catastrophic flooding. We'll get into some example projects a little bit later in the presentation. Next slide, please. The strategy is both implementing and providing on the ground be benefits now, while also planning for the long term. Ultimately, the Chehalis Basin Board will recommend a package of investments and strategies to protect Chehalis Basin people, fish, and wildlife for decades to come. We'll speak more to where we're at in that process in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. Since 2012, the strategy has invested nearly $152 million in on-the-ground flood preparation, flood damage reduction, and aquatic species restoration. We have completed over 140 projects with dozens more underway. And just a few examples from the previous biennium, that would be mid-2021 to mid-2023, which we just finished. Uh, in those two years, we completed and continued 68 flood damage reduction projects. We helped 2,184 people register for high water alerts as part of the Chehalis Basin Flood Warning System, which is a 62% increase from 2021. And we engaged over 30 landowners in aquatic species restoration plan projects. You and your neighbors across the region know better than anybody what's needed now and for the future. The Chehalis Basin strategy depends on experiences, knowledge, and input from residents like you to decide where and how to invest in solutions across the Chehalis Basin. Now let's talk a little bit about the Chehalis Basin Board and the phased approach. So next slide, please. The Chehalis Basin strategy uses a phased approach to reduce flood damage and restore aquatic life. Slide, please. There are three phases to the Chehalis Basin strategy. Phase one was early action implementation and initial strategy development. That's the phase that we just completed, early projects and starting to work on the strategy. Phase two is midterm action implementation and release of the final integrated long-term strategy. That's the part that we're working on right now. Phase three is the integrated strategy full implementation with ongoing monitoring and adaptive management. That's where we'll be once we have agreed to a strategy. Next slide, please. So let's talk about phase one, which is the early action implementation and initial strategy development. This was this first stretch of time from 2012 to 2023 that we just wrapped up. The Chehalis Basin strategy made significant on the ground project improvements to meaningfully restore aquatic species and reduce flood damage across the region. Since 2012, the strategy invested nearly $152 million in on-the-ground flood preparation, flood damage reduction, and aquatic species restoration, and has completed more than 140 projects with dozens more on the way. Slide, please. So in phase one, the strategy has made significant progress to advance our near-term priorities and set in place these foundational structures on which we will build phase two. 
we've made uh, uh, we have also worked on uh, building new programs, collaborative decision making structures, state of the art climate and fish modeling, and also exploratory analyses to identify the suite of strategy options to inform these long term planning decisions. Next slide, please. Phase two, the midterm action implementation and release of the final integrated long-term strategy. We are here in the process and we expect to complete this sometime between the end of 2024 and 2026. This phase is really focused on decision-making and scaled project implementation. Slide, please. The Chehalis Basin Board uh, is going to finalize a vision for the integrated long-term Chehalis Basin strategy, including decision, early decisions about how to reduce flood damages, uh, how much to invest in the different programs and priorities of the strategy, when and in what order to tackle the many priorities of the basin, and the metrics that we'll use to monitor how well the strategy is actually working. Slide, please. Once all the major elements of the long-term strategy are decided on, the Office of Chehalis Basin, the Chehalis Basin Board, and our partners will continue to work collaboratively to continue uh, to secure appropriate funding from diverse sources, like federal, state, and local sources, to scale our implementation to meet the goals of the strategy, and to adaptively manage implementation and investments so that we optimize success. And if you're interested in learning more, you can look at the latest report that we submitted to the Washington legislature, uh, which we will go ahead and provide a link to in the chat. And now I'm going to turn it over to Cindy to talk about some on the ground work. Thanks, Nat. So uh, what Nat has just spoke to was the strategy at really at that higher level. And now I'd like to zoom in a little bit more on what the work that we are gonna be doing over the next two years. Next slide. So the Washington State Legislature uh, recently provided $70 million to support the Chehalis Basin strategy through the 2023 and 2025 biennium, which began July of first of this year and runs through July, June 30th of 2025. So 60.8 million of the funding is for flood damage reduction and aquatic species restoration project work. 5.2 million is for integrated projects that improve both the flooding and habitat or what we refer to as integrated efforts. And 3.9 million is for OCB and board operation. This appropriation would not be possible without the collaboration from the Chehalis Basin Board, the advocacy of our local legislators and partners who are doing on the ground work in the basin. Um, so, sorry, I think we're- Sorry, Cindy. I need to go back one slide. One slide? Okay. Yeah, it's okay. So as we discussed earlier, funds will support both immediate and long-term progress across our mission's uh, three key focuses. And I'd like to take a deeper dive in what we are doing in each of them. But before I do that, I do wanna emphasize a couple of things about the strategy projects. First is that participation in this process and the strategy is 100% voluntary. And second is that projects really do rely on local leadership and partners that understand the community need and they help guide us to provide the best support to them. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, one of the focus areas that I'm gonna take a, a closer look at is related to the local flood protection efforts. And I want to start out by talking about our flood assistance that are, is provided to residents and businesses. Next slide. 
The Office of Chehalis Basin offers flood assistance to local residents and businesses through a wide range of small scale projects and actions to reduce flood damage from flooding. Uh, we offer support through individualized flood assistance, so each case is different, and we look to provide the best guidance that is applicable to each of those situations. We also support flood response planning efforts, giving guidance and resources on what to do in case of a flooding event, and we work with landowners and businesses to implement flood protection measures, so things such as home elevations, and retrofitting homes for flood vent systems. Next slide. Uh, starting in the summer of this year, in 2023, OCB has 10 proposed pilot projects, which include eight home elevations and two potential voluntary property purchases. These projects have already taught us a ton about the important considerations and potential challenges that come with project implementation. And while we are in our pilot phase of this work, we know that this is an, a successful example of flood protection programs that have um, been displayed through Washington State and other areas. Next slide. A uh, second focus area within our local flood protection efforts includes our technical assistance that we provide to our local governments and tribal governments. Next slide. Our support to the tribes and local governments include education, training, workshops, and other technical assistance. We provide community rating system support, which helps support local governments join the community rating system and help them identify activities that could assist residents who are facing increasing, increasingly higher national flood insurance policy premiums. We're also supporting local governments with both their floodplain rules and regulations. Next slide. So as it was mentioned earlier, we really do rely on the partners to make this strategy successful. And one of the great partnerships we like to highlight is with the local Chehalis uh, River Flood Authority. Next slide. Uh, during this biennium, there has been $3.5 million provided to develop and implement local projects as part of the Chehalis Basin strategy. In the next two years, 88% of the funding that is going to be used will be on the ground construction and implementation of projects. And on average, these local flood projects take less than two years to complete and provide major return on investments for residents and local businesses, offering tangible, meaningful benefits that happen quickly. The Flood Authority is also the lead on developing and implementing the critically important flood warning system that's provided to residents and businesses. Next slide, please. Another great example of work that's being done through the Flood Authority um, is the Hall Road Midterm Project. It's a great example of an urgent project in which the Chehalis Basin Board was asked to uh, provide an initial $550,000 that supports a critical infrastructure protection effort allowing project sponsors to respond quickly. And in just a few months, the first leg of that Hall Road erosion project was complete. This project focuses on protection of critical infrastructure in the Grays Harbor area. And this infrastructure was really developed as a public, as a public utility use and has a hundred year lifespan. So doing preventative actions was really necessary to reduce longer term costs and damage that could have occurred. This, this project includes log pilings and log jacks along 500 feet of river bank, which slows down the river flow and captures large woody debris and sediment that will ultimately give the Port of Grace Harbor time to take longer term action. 
I'm going to pass it back to Nat to dive a little bit into the work that we are doing with uh, landowners to slow harmful erosion and restore habitat for salmon and other aquatic life. Thank you so much, Cindy. Most of the work that we do to improve uh, habitat and outcomes for aquatic life comes under the Aquatic Species Restoration Plan. Next, please. Habitat restoration projects are happening across the region as a part of the Chehalis Basin Strategy Aquatic Species Restoration Plan. This is a 30-year science-based roadmap of actions and on-the-ground projects that could restore and protect more than 550 miles of prioritized habitat for salmon, steelhead, and for other aquatic species. Next, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project that's one example of the many projects that happen under the Aquatic Species Restoration Plan, the Stillman Creek Restoration Project. This is the largest ASRP project to date. It's part of the ASRP program, and it's now over two thirds complete. Due to a number of land management practices, and loss of riparian vegetation, Stillman Creek was in need of habitat restoration work to help fish in times of high river flows. Similarly, low flow summer habitat had been has been degraded by historical riparian clearing and by straightening of the river channel, which simultaneously reduces habitat diversity and increases water temperature. By reintroducing large wood, excavating new pilot channels, and enhancing riparian habitat through plantings, this project will slow down river speeds, which reduces erosion in the agricultural areas of the property and protects riparian plantings. It will reconnect the floodplain, and it will provide safe spaces for fish and aquatic species during flood events. And the riparian plantings, the plantings along the banks of the river, will help lower stream temperatures, while the pilot channels will open new areas of diverse habitat. Next, please. Another program that we have uh, is the Erosion Management Program. This is one of the newest programs that the uh, strategy works with. Next, please. Unnaturally high erosion rates are a top concern throughout the Chehalis Basin. We use natural proven techniques to slow erosion and provide protection from flooding and benefit aquatic habitat. This program serves both public and private landowners who are willing to work with a local project sponsor, such as a conservation district, to address either urgent or long-term erosion concerns that threaten public infrastructure, private residential structures, commercial structures, or agricultural land. We've just moved into the implementation phase in the last couple of months, and we've already received applications from a couple of sponsors uh, who have local landowners that want to participate. And we have more information about that program on our website that you can find, as with many of the other things we've posted tonight, in the chat. So you'll get a link to that. Now I'm gonna pass it back to Cindy, who's gonna cover the final section of our deep dive, uh, covering how we are preparing the region and its future generations for more frequent major and catastrophic flooding. Thanks, Nat. <clears throat> so um, residents who have lived in this basin for decades really know that there has been some long-standing discussions about how to protect against large-scale flood damage. It's imperative that the strategy creates the safest future possible for creating future generations um, that never have to experience the same devastation as during the 07 and 09 floods. Protecting communities from, from flood risk at the scale that is needed in the Chehalis Basin is both costly and complicated. And the Chehalis Basin Board is preparing to weigh options for protecting against these catastrophic flooding events and to, take, to make recommendations for what 
combination of next steps and actions that could be taken to create a long-term solution to flood damage in the basin. Next slide. One of these options that is included in the proposed is the proposed Chehalis River Flood Retention Facility, or also known as the dam. Next slide. The local flood control zone district is proposing, has proposed a potential emergency flood retention facility or dam on the upper Chehalis River. And this facility would retain flood waters only during the events of major or catastrophic floods, such as what we experienced in the 07 or 09 flooding event. And the this proposal is currently in the, um, is moving forward in the SEPA and NEPA federal and state environmental impact statement process with coordination between local agencies, tribes, and the project sponsor. Next slide. And concurrently, the board has requested additional information on alternatives to address regional flooding, including what is referred to as the local action non-dam alternative. Next slide. Released in April of 2023, the Local Action Non-Dam Alternative Report has uh, proposed a combination of new and extended levees, channel modifications on the Chehalis River, a voluntary flood proofing and structure relocation program, restoration efforts and policy changes that would work together to reduce flood damage across the upper Chehalis Basin. This, hap this uh, like I said, is happening in parallel with the final state and federal environmental review of the proposed dam and to provide, and it's providing the board with a full understanding of all of the available options. And while several studies about the non-dam alter alternative have happened over the years, these efforts are not repeating work that has already been done. It will consider and draw from existing projects and analyses and examine how potential solutions may fit together to achieve similar results as the proposed dam. Next slide. And the final project I want to highlight tonight is uh, so that supports the region-wide flood resiliency efforts is what we refer to as the North Shore Levy Project. Next slide. The North Shore Levy highlights a large-scale flood protection project that has grown over the years and is poised to provide major flood benefits for the lower Chehalis Basin. This project will provide long-term flood risk reduction and climate change resiliency benefits to the cities of Aberdeen and Hoquiam, and Washington. And this, the cities have just received $18.5 million in flooding from the state legislature this year, separate from the strategy and has attracted tens of millions of federal funding from FEMA and beyond. And this is a great example of an individual project that is really driven by local communities and city leadership and support uh, that's been supported by the Chehalis Basin Board. This project links together multiple partners, it's grown in scale, and it has attracted support from both OCB and beyond. Next slide. So um, I know I've talked, we've both talked about several resources and information and we, that we are gonna continue to provide over the next biennium. So I will just uh, provide a quick recap of those before we move on to the Q&A section. Next slide. You can always uh, visit the website, the ShehalisBasinStrategy.com slash Basin Residence, where you can find information on emergency preparedness, flood proofing assistance, the erosion management program, habitat restoration efforts, and more. This, the strategy really exists as a resource for all of you that have participated and those people that work and live in the basin. 
We're really here to assist you and connect you with what you need to keep your families, homes, businesses safe from flood damage while protecting and improving habitat at the same time. And we really hope that you all stay engaged and take part in this important collaborative effort and make your community and region safer, the safer, more prosperous place to live and work. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Casey. She is gonna um, drop another poll. I believe it is similar uh, to the same one that you saw at the very beginning. And she's gonna ask a few questions. I think we're gonna take a, a minute or so for the people participating to answer. Um, how well do you know the Chehalis Basin after this um, brief presentation? And we'll just give it a few minutes to um, have people weigh in. Right, we'll just give it uh, just a few more seconds, see if we can get anybody else. It's, it's again, it's, you know, giving us feedback on based on what you've heard tonight. If, if you understand the Shayla's Basin strategy any better. Um, and then I think once we close this poll, just give it just a little bit longer, we will open it up for uh, the broader Q&A. Yeah, and like uh, Liz, like Lizzie has just uh, dropped in the chat. So, what questions do you still have about the Chehalis Basin strategy? Um, you can drop those in the Q and A box, and Nat and I can um, try to answer some of those questions for you. All right, um, Casey, I think we can drop the poll maybe and um, see if Nat, we wanna start some of that Q and A. Yeah, that sounds great. I think, um, I'll tell you what, the first question I'm seeing uh, is about erosion. So I think I can grab that one and then maybe we can trade off. Okay. So uh, first question I see uh, is my property spans a mile of riverbank on the main stem Chehalis and Elma. I am currently working with the conservation district to manage large areas of erosion, but we're running up against funding issues to install log jacks or plantings and bank reshaping. Is this something the strategy can help with in terms of funding, installation, et cetera? If so, who do I contact? So the short answer to that is yes, that is something we can help with. Um, but the funding is limited. So the main point of contact there is your local conservation district. You'll want to get in touch with them. Uh, if you're in Elma, I am assuming that's the Grace Harbor Conservation District. Um, apologies if I got that wrong. But you're, uh, you should talk to your local conservation district. Uh, we have already had a couple of projects. We have a lot of interest in the erosion management program, and it's new. So funding is somewhat limited. So we certainly can't guarantee funding for an erosion project, um, but we may be able to help you and the conservation district is the place to start. All right, I think, uh, let's see. The next question I see is how will you monitor the effectiveness of the erosion and habitat restoration projects? I think that's a really, Great question. Um, and Nat, you can jump in if if I miss anything, because I know you are championing the erosion uh, efforts. But I think that one of the, the big ways that we're measuring effectiveness of these projects is looking at historic, how, what the historical, um, where the, the 
historical levels were for some of these areas of restoration and then looking forward to um, see what type of prevention we've we've made. But these projects also, I do want to note, it does take a long time to measure effectiveness of some of these larger scale habitat restoration and erosion projects. So um, we are constantly doing monitoring after projects are complete to ensure that riparian plantings are being are successful and that um, that you know we've slowed down those um, those degradation of the habitat. So Nat, I don't know if there's any a thing additional you'd want to add to that. Yeah, that was a great summary, Cindy. I think what I would add is I mentioned earlier the Aquatic Species Restoration Plan which is the main program through which we do habitat restoration projects. And right now, somewhere between 15 and 20% of the funding of that program is on what we call adaptive management. So that's monitoring, uh, reviewing the results of that monitoring, and then feeding that back into the program to change how they implement so that it becomes more and more effective over time. The goal is to kind of drive down the cost of that adaptive management over time so that it takes up a smaller and smaller chunk and we can focus more on on the ground work. But we're never going to stop doing adaptive management to make sure that we're being as effective as possible with our projects. Which actually is a great call into the next question. Are there any measurable outcomes from the projects? The short answer to that is yes, absolutely, and it depends on the project, but uh, Cindy has actually done some work on our metrics, so maybe I'll let Cindy jump on that one first. Um, I think that some of the measurable outcomes really is how are we utilizing the strategy um, dollars, and so we need to be good stewards of the funding, and like Nat said, this the monitoring and adaptive management work is really one example of something that we can measure for projects. Um, and really it one of the, uh, the other things that we try to measure is how much we can get participation in this process. So like I said, this these projects are 100% voluntary. So if we're successful at actually getting participation in this strategy is one uh, great example of, of how we are trying to measure some of that success. Yeah. There's one pretty straightforward question there. Where is the location of the emergency flood control dam proposed? Um, and we, we can answer that. So that is on the main stem Chehalis River up near the town of PL. So it's a little bit past upstream of PL on the Chehalis, um, getting up towards what is now Weyerhaeuser territory. Uh, this next question is, when is the NEPA process expected to be completed about the dam? Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, Nat, but I believe that the SEPA and NEPA process um, is slated to release a final environmental impact statement near the end of the biennium. Yeah, that's about right, Cindy. I will say those are two different processes, right? So SEPA is the state, uh, the state environmental process, and NEPA is the national environmental process, and they're not necessarily tied together. Um, so there's potentially slightly different times when they'll come out, but they are aiming for um, uh, for about what Cindy said towards the. Uh, sometime in late 2024, early 2025. Of course, things can happen, uh, times can change, but that is the goal right now. So this next question, who is the project sponsor for the dam? Uh, yeah, that one's a relatively straightforward question. So that is the Lewis County Flood Control Zone District. 
Uh, that is a special purpose district that um, exists in Lewis County uh, in order to do flood damage reduction work. And uh, almost all of what they do right now um, is serve as the sponsor for that uh, proposed dam. And I do want to make a, a, a distinction here because I know it can be confusing for some folks. So the flood control zone district is the sponsor for the dam. There is a separate entity called the flood authority. And that is throughout the whole basin and includes numerous local, um, local jurisdictions, local governments, and those are two separate entities. So flood control zone district sponsors the dam, the flood authority builds projects and runs the warning system. So the next uh, comment, I, I think it's more of a comment than a question. Uh, it says, I think it is important to let people know that the flood retention facility is not intended to be a permanent dam. Rather, it will be open flow, uh, open flow facility that will only close during major rain events like a pineapple express. So similar to what we had said for the 07 flood. And I think it will, and it says it will be returned to open flow after the event has passed. Since the 09 flood, it would have only been closed twice. So I think that's a good addition to um, what we had mentioned. Yeah, we. I mean, we can build on that a little bit. The The way it's designed uh, is what they call run of the river. So when it's not closed, the river flows freely underneath it as currently proposed, um, and fish can freely pass upstream and downstream. Uh, so yeah, so it's a little different from the standard dam that you may have seen, that you have definitely seen because we all live in the Pacific Northwest. And I see the last question we have here is, what do you know about flooding historically? That is before settlers came to the region, and how local tribal people managed flooding for thousands of years. Do we know what their management strategies have been? That is a great question. And, and to some degree, we do know that and, 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 uh, and try and think about that. So um, we don't have a huge amount of evidence, but what evidence we have indicates that yes, flooding was a pretty common occurrence throughout the Chehalis Basin well before European settlement and that the folks who lived along here were well aware of it and worked around it. Um, as far as specific management strategies, uh, that's a lot tougher. I mean, as you, as you well know, the, the tribes that lived here you know, went through a, um, a devastating period in their history and they lost a lot of the cultural knowledge that they would have had. So um, we, don't, we don't know all of the ways that they would have managed flooding. Um, but we do know uh, that they had strategies uh, basically amounting to stay, stay out of the way of the river when it floods. Um, unfortunately, we don't know much more than that. Um, and we do uh, work with uh, both of the local tribes in the region, as we mentioned, the Quinault Indian Nation and the Confederated Tribes, the Chehalis Reservation. And uh, we do try to incorporate tribal knowledge in our work when we can. Those are all of the questions that we see in our Q&A. If you have any more questions, feel free to drop them in. I'd be happy to answer them. And if you think of something afterwards, uh, there have been a bunch of links to our website, uh, which includes several options for getting a hold of us. Uh, you can send in questions and ask us things that way. I see we did get one more. What happens when the dam is closed and fish need to go upstream to spawn? Yeah, that's that's a good question. That's starting to get into the details of how that proposed dam would operate. So the the dam is being designed uh, with a few things in mind, and I I, I want to clarify that I am I am not the the dam sponsor or designer. So some of these details we may have to to get back to folks on. But there are kind of two periods in which you need to think about. One is when the dam is being constructed and the flood control zone district is building detailed plans for how fish would move past that construction zone while it's on construction. 
The other thing I think is more what you were asking, once the dam is constructed, when it's closed, how do the fish move upstream and downstream? Um, for spawning in particular, uh, there wouldn't be a lot of overlap uh, expected between when fish go upstream to spawn and when the dam is likely to be closed, just because of when fish actually do their upstream migration. Um, but as far as the details of how that works, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I don't have an answer off the top of my head, um, but we can, uh, we can find an answer for that. Uh, the next question that just popped up, I think, is what about the footprint of the dam and the waters it would hold back? And is there a plan to mitigate the impacts to vegetation? I think uh, the, the, to the first question, I don't have exact numbers of uh, acre feet that it would um, inundate behind the dam if the, the, the walls were closed, but we do, um, the, the proponents do have more specific information on um, what a historical flood impact that would be, and we would have to get you a little bit more detail from their proposal. Um, and then as far as the plan to mitigate, as part of the NEPA and SEPA process, they are providing significant um, mitigation plans that would address the, the impacts to the loss of vegetation um, in the inundation zone and um, within the footprint of the the facility. Yeah, thanks, Cindy. Uh, a couple a couple of things to to add to that. The um, flood control zone district is actively working on a vegetation mitigation plan, so that will be something that they submit back to the state and the Army Corps of Engineers um, in order to get um, in order for them to better review the project. Um, I would also refer folks to the website of the Flood Control Zone District. Uh, so that entity has a lot of detail on what they are proposing and how it would work. And it includes some details about what folks have already said, how fish would pass past the dam, impacts to uh, vegetation, all those kinds of things. So I would encourage you to go to their website and look at their materials. They have lots of information about how they believe that dam would operate. And I believe Kylan just dropped that in the chat for folks as well. Thanks, Kylan. Those are all the questions that I'm seeing. We'd like to thank you for spending a bit of time on a Wednesday afternoon with us. I hope this was really informative and useful for you. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, uh, feel free to go to our website and uh, use all of the information there to learn more about what we're doing or get in touch with us if you have other questions. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to close up now. So everyone have a great night.